Isn't the baptism wonderful? Amen. I, I, I wish I could tell the deacons to fill that pool up every Sunday. Uh, today, as we continue this series on uh, counterfeit Christianity, I want to ask, are you a follower of Jesus? Yes. Are you a... I, I heard that, yes. That's wonderful. I hope we all can say yes. You know, are we truly a born-again believer in Jesus Christ? <coughs> or as, uh, as we'll be reading here in a moment, can we be charged with being a counterfeit? For a lot of us, you know, as Christians, we kind of dismiss this question because it almost feels redundant or unnecessary. Of course I'm a Christian. I mean, I filled all the squares. I walked the aisle. I shook the hand of the pastor. I said the sinner's prayer, got dunked in the pool. You know, those are important things. Those are important things that we make this confession of faith. It is important that we get baptized by the commandment of our Lord. These are all good. But is that all there is? Is it over? Oh, we're done. We can kick back now. If we were put on trial for being a Christian, what is the evidence that will convict us? Think about that for a minute. You know, I've got one of those Jesus dishes on the back bumper of my car. Is that enough? Maybe I go to church regularly. You know, at least when there's not a sporting event that I, I need to see on television or, or, or attend. You know, I own more than three Bibles. I've got a praise song for my ringtone. Okay, well, that, well, is that enough? My picture's in the church directory. I listen to Christian radio in the car. Some may even say I teach Sunday school. I'm a deacon. I chair numerous church committees. I give regularly to all the special offerings all through the year. <clears throat> and there are some even today say I'm a Christian because I vote Republican. <laughs> The real test, the real indicator of life, of a life that has been saved by the grace of God, is a life that has been changed. A life that reflects a daily relationship with the Savior. A life that lives obediently to the will of God. Today, we're not looking at what the world, who the world says we are. The world may convict us as a, as a Christian. But the question is, who does Jesus say we are? Who does Jesus say we are? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're getting towards the end of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preaches. And it's telling us about the way we should act and conduct our lives and the way we should pray and the way we should give and all these things. Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what scary words these are. Lord, I, I, I pray that one day when I meet Jesus, that he won't say, I never knew you, but he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, that's the prayer for all of us this morning. 
Lord, may we be found in Jesus and not just simply playing the part. Lord, move your spirit in this place today and may Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. You know, a lot of people don't like to wear their seatbelts, even though it's the law. I don't like to wear their seatbelts in the car. But uh, according to the Associated Press, a New Zealander whose name was Ivan Sigodnin took it to an extreme. The police had ticketed him 32 times over five years for failing to use his seatbelt. And even though it was costing him big bucks, he, Ivan, refused to buckle up. Finally, instead of outright... Uh, instead of obeying the law, he decided to rely on a deception. He made a fake seat belt that when he climbed into the car, he would just toss it over his shoulder, and it would look like he was wearing a seat belt when he was not. Ivan was a counterfeit seat belt wearer. <laughs> and you know what? He was finally exposed as such. You see, his trick worked for, for a while. Then one day he was on a he was in a head-on <coughs> collision. He was thrust up against his steering wheel and he was killed. The man's disobedience caused his death. But you see, disobedience to God can cause even more trouble and can cause even a worse death. Today's passage from Jesus and from his message on the Sermon on the Mount, you can find it in chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. And in context to our verses, and we got to put everything in the context so we understand the real meaning of it, he talks about false prophets in those verses that follow. You can look in your Bibles, verses 15 to 20. The last verse of that section is key. Let's look at it for just a second. Matthew 7, verse 20. He says, Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. You see, Jesus calls us to be fruit inspectors to spot false teachers and the false prophets. And last week we talked about them. They're readily available. You can find anybody to teach whatever it is that you want to hear. We talked about having our ears tickled last week. But what about us? <clears throat> what kind of fruits are we producing? Will people accuse us of being a Christian by the fruit they see us produce? Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Calling Jesus Lord, Lord is not a bad thing. I pray we all call upon the name of the Lord. But he says not everybody who does so will enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, belonging to test, the test for belonging to Jesus is not in our vocabulary. In other words, I have all the church vocabulary. I know all the right words. That is, uh, that is not a shoe in to heaven. The key in today's message is this. It's that last line that says, But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Hang with me on this. Uh, I'm, uh, towards the end of the message, I'm going to talk about that. You see, unless we have Jesus, unless we have the <laughs> Spirit, we're not capable of doing the will of God. Warren Worsby, one of my favorite commentators, he, 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 makes, he makes a statement. He says, how easy it is to learn a religious vocabulary and to even memorize Bible verses and religious songs and yet not obey God's will. <laughs> Words are not a substitute for obedience and neither are religious works. You see, we've got Bible studies. We discuss, we debate, we appraise, and we admire the Word of God. And these are important things, and I don't want to discount them. 
But it is not the theological discourses of the Word of God that matters. What matters is, is if we do what the Word of God says. We can have all the understanding in the world, but if we don't do what it says, it matters little. James 1.22, we, we studied James on Wednesday nights. We went over this verse last Wednesday night. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We fool ourselves if we believe God's will is accomplished merely or only by discussing and analyzing his word. We must be doers of the word. Jesus said in uh, Luke 11 verse 28, he says, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The question I'm often asked, well, just what is the will of God? You know, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know if God wants me to go to deep dark Africa to be a missionary? And I would answer, are you doing the will of God that you know? Are you doing what you know God wants you to do? If you're not doing what you know, why would God reveal anything further to you? Jesus makes the comment in Luke 6, verse 46. And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? You see, this is a very serious question. If we call Jesus Lord, is he really Lord? Is he really ruler of our lives? Or are we just giving him lip service? Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes, he said over in Matthew 15, verses 7 and 9, he calls them hypocrites. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth. And honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Is your love for Jesus more than mere lip service? We claim we know Jesus, and indeed we are saved by grace and not by works. But where's the evidence? Where's the evidence of our salvation? Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. John tells us, this is in 1 John chapter 2. Just read this earlier. I hope you take this to heart. And I've used these verses before. John, 1 John 2, verses 3 through 5. By, now by this we know that we know him. Under word, understand that word know. That means to know by experience. That means more than just simply book knowledge. We know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. I'm not calling him a liar. The word of God is calling him a liar. He says he is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. You see, keeping the word, obeying his commandments, that's how we learn. That's how we learn the mind of God. This is how we become uh, what he calls us to be and we get further understanding and we grow in maturity by following his commands. If we claim to know Jesus, then we ought to be busy doing what he has commands. But what about doing religious things? You know, religious activity, listen carefully, lists, religious activities can never take the place of actually obeying Jesus' commands. Matthew 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? First thing I want to ask is, what day is that? When it says, many will say to me in that day. That day he's referring to is judgment day. Judgment day. 
And actually, if we want to dig into it, the judgment that he is referring to is that great white throne judgment. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Look it up. Read it. It will scare you. You see, the great white throne judgment is where the condemned is judged. We as believers, those that are in Christ, will never see the great white throne judgment. We have passed judgment, and we are passed into life. Praise the Lord. We're talking about those that are being judged here. And it says, on that day, one day, when that day comes, many surprised so-called Christians will be appearing before that great white throne. That will include preachers. That will include deacons. That will include Sunday school teachers. The truly saved will not be there. This is a tough passage to preach. This is tough. You see, religious activity by itself does not demonstrate salvation. Preaching and prophesying in the name of Jesus. Casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Performing miracles in the name of Jesus. None of these activities are disputed by Jesus. He's not saying unsaved can't do them. Look at Judas. Judas preached. He prophesied. He cast out demons. Performed miracles. Just like and alongside the other disciples. Yet he was not saved by these activities. Neither are we. It's all about doing God's will. I hate to use my children as an example, but sometimes they, uh, they perform such lovely uh, uh, sermon illustrations. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell one of my children, I'll say, you know, go clean your bedroom. And they say, well, you know, I emptied the dishwasher. I emptied the trash. And those are well, fine, and good. Those are great things. But you didn't clean your room. You didn't clean your room. You didn't do what I asked you to do. You see, you can be busy about the Lord's work and still not obey Him. You can be busy saying, I taught a great Sunday school class. But I'm never going to forgive my brother for what he did to me. I work with the poor and homeless. I give my very soul to those that are in need. But I just cussed out the clerk over at Walmart. <coughs> Others will say, I volunteer for every mission trip that comes up. I'll go to the ends of the earth for Jesus. But I won't witness to my next door neighbor. <coughs> You see, performing signs and wonders is not enough to prove you belong to Jesus. The fact is, many fool the world around them. We may even fool ourselves. But you can't fool Jesus. And you know, there's something more important than knowing about Jesus. is experiencing Him. And He to know you. Look at verse 23. Then I, this is Jesus, he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Will Jesus declare that he knows you? I, I want you to note the language here. You know, uh, words mean a lot. He, he doesn't say, I, I, you know, I knew you previously, but I don't know you now. He says, I never, I never knew you. I never knew you. <coughs> Jesus will not know for lots of reasons. I don't know. You know, he might not know you because you don't know him in front of others. Jesus tells us over in Matthew 10, verses 32 to 33, he says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. 
But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Are we confessing Jesus to the world, regardless of what the world is telling us? We look around, we see the voice of the martyrs and other groups that uh, attend to persecuted Christians around there around the world. There are Christians that are losing their families, losing their livelihoods, losing all that they have, including their very lives, because they profess the name of Jesus before men. Nowhere in the Bible do I read about Jesus calling secret agents for him. There are no secret agents for Jesus. There are those that have played the part of a Christian for years and yet are unsaved. They do not know Jesus personally. <laughs> and Jesus would say, I never knew you. These are the counterfeit Christians that we are looking at today. How does Jesus refer to these counterfeits? He calls them. He says, you who practice lawlessness. If you have the NIV Bible, it says he calls them evildoers. The Holman Christian Standard Bible calls them lawbreakers. You see, being good in our eyes, doing all the right things in our eyes will never be good enough for God. Knowing Jesus. I love that verse over uh, uh, John 17, verse 3, where Jesus is praying and he defines eternal life. He defines eternal life of knowing the Father and knowing Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Knowing him. You see, there's two different Greek words for knowing. One, one word is for book knowing. I know them because I have read about them. And the other knowing is knowing experientially. Knowing him because I have felt his presence. Knowing Jesus and Jesus knowing you. This morning, it's not up to me to expose the Christian counterfeiters. Praise the Lord for that. God has not given me that discernment. That is not my job. My job, we talked about last week, my job is to preach the word. Is to preach the word. 2 Timothy uh, 4 verse 2. Preach the word in season and out. Our job, all of us, each of our, each of us individually, we are called to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Paul writes, he says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. This morning we're approaching this table. This is the table of the Lord. And we are called each to make such an examination. To see if we're really in the faith. Are we routinely showing the fruits of the Spirit? that dwells inside of us? Are we living our faith in real and tangible ways? Do we have a relationship with Jesus that is ongoing day in and day out? And how do we show that we truly love Jesus? This verse we had just a few minutes ago, John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments you see obedience is the one single factor of salvation uh, excuse me not factor indicator <coughs> how do you know do we obey him that's the indicator we do not obey to be saved in fact, it is impossible to be faithfully obedient unless we are truly saved and, and have His Spirit residing within us. We are obedient because we are saved. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you 
can do nothing. <laughs> For without me, you can do nothing. Without true salvation in Jesus, without truly knowing him, and Jesus knowing you, it is just an act. You're fooling the world, you're fooling yourselves, but you will be exposed sooner or later. We come to the table, and this is a time, the time that we have, and as we sing the invitation, this is a time of, of uh, examination. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, this is after he explains the Lord's <laughs> Supper, he says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We come to this Lord's table having examined ourselves, knowing that we are in the faith. I'm going to have, I, I have to ask a hard question, and that is, if you're not sure, I ask you, please don't partake. This is for true believers. That's a hard question to ask, but this is, this is the Lord's table. This isn't Rosemont's table. This isn't my table. This is the Lord's table. We come to the Lord's table, those who truly know him. We're, as we sing this hymn and we're having a time of prayer, we need to make sure that we are right before God, knowing that we are covered by the blood of Jesus and that we possess his spirit, enabling us to be the obedient servant that he has called us to be. We're going to sing a hymn. It's called Whiter Than Snow. You see, it's only by His Spirit that we are made presentable. It's certainly not anything that we have done. It's certainly not anything that we have performed to make ourselves presentable. It is what He has done for us. And because of what He has done for us, I owe all to Him. And I am obedient because He has enabled me to be obedient. Have He made you whiter than snow. Let us go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. We do come before you in humble submission and humbly knowing what your word tells us. Knowing that you shed your blood to cover our sins. <coughs> Lord, we ask you we ask you to fill us with your spirit that we might know that we know that we know that we know Jesus. And we know him because we are obedient to the word. For that's what shows it. Lord, there are some people here this morning that are questioning that. That is questioning whether they know you. Lord, I ask for your spirit to move and that you draw each one of us to yourselves. Lord, there may be those that need to rededicate. There are those that may need to come to know you for the very first time. Lord, whatever that decision is this morning, I ask for your spirit to move, that your spirit to touch, your spirit to fill in this place today. <clears throat> As we come to this table, Lord, that we might come in sincerity of heart, knowing that we have confessed all to you. May Jesus be glorified, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>